All right, um, welcome everybody to today's um, seminar. We are very glad to have um, Greg today. Greg is, of course, an organizer of the series and has done many important work and contributions that have to do with the theory of neural networks and learning. Most prominently, he has worked on the NTK and the Tensor program. And his talk today will um, include these methods to talk about future learning in infinite bits neural networks. Greg, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks Fabian for the intro. Uh, so let, let me dive straight into it. So I'll be talking about uh, feature learning in uh, infinite width neural networks. And this is joint work with uh, my co-author, uh, ex-Microsoft AI resident, uh, Edward Hu. Um, and this is also the fourth paper of the Tensor Program series. If you have uh, seen the previous papers before, uh, the previous three are in some sense uh, building up the foundation of the uh, the technique, the tensor program technique, and this paper uh, is the first major payoff uh, of that foundation. So, oh, oh, there you go. All right. Um, so, feature learning is very crucial in deep learning. Uh, there are two very prominent examples of this. Uh, the first is in the vision domain, where we have ImageNet and models like ResNet, Inception, and so on. Uh, these, this is the first time uh, in the modern age where uh, we are able to uh, train very, very good image classifier that match human performance. And more importantly, we are able to uh, use the learned features from uh, the, this pre-trained ResNet, for example, for downstream tasks like uh, object detection. Um, the other major example, of course, uh, is uh, in the NLP domain where we have bird and GPT family of models. Uh, here we pre-train on a very large corpus of text uh, and the model is some kind of transformer. And uh, we essentially learn a very good language representation uh, from this pre-training and in downstream tasks like uh, translation or natural language understanding, uh, we're able to very uh, uh, effectively leverage this pre-training to achieve very good results. And so for example, these kind of transformer models are shipped into Google and Bing. Um, so the, the key insight that uh, it contextualizes uh, this talk is that pre-training and transfer learning cannot happen without feature learning. And let me explain uh, why this is the case. Uh, so first, let me just uh, briefly uh, review what pre-training and transfer learning is uh, for those of you who might not have been exposed to this. Um, so pre-training means that you amass a very large cheap data set on some general domain. So, uh, you know, ImageNet is composed of images that are cr crowdsourced and uh, uh, GPT, for example, is trained on Reddit data set essentially uh, and other uh, data set, uh, data, natural language data set on the internet. Uh, in the second step, we're interested in uh, uh, some specific downstream tasks like uh, natural language understanding. Uh, in this case, we have uh, expensive but well-labeled data, uh, which is, uh, you know, in contrast to the cheap and large data set in general domain, this is very small. Um, so in this fine-tuning step, the second stage, we take the pre-trained model and uh, we uh, essentially train it on, on the, the small amount of data uh, and uh, in the end, what we usually observe is that this, uh, this fine tuning stage uh, uh, gives us a very good performance compared to uh, if we had no pre-training at all. And this is, uh, for example, the case with uh, natural language understanding with uh, BERT. Um, very, more specifically, uh, during fine tuning, we discard the readout layer or the classifier layer from pre-training. And this is simply just for the reason that during pre-training the, the label class, right? The, the classes, the, the space of outputs is usually different than when you do fine tuning, right? Your objectives are usually different. Uh, for example, a downstream task could be a hot dog detector, right? So it's hot dog or not hot dog, but during pre-training, so let's say you, you pre-train you pre on ImageNet, that's a thousand classes. So it makes no sense to use the same readout layer. Uh, so you discard the, the readout layer from pre-training and uh, in the simplest form of fine tuning, uh, we train this new readout layer only. So the problem is entirely a linear problem. Um, and in, in this context of linear fine tuning, uh, 
we can easily observe the following fact. Uh, if pre-training improves linear fine tuning, then the embeddings, i.e. the features of the inputs must change during pre-training, right? Because again, this problem is linear. So if the, the features are the same as from random initialization, then uh, pre-training really hasn't uh, given you anything more, right? So for, for linear fine tuning to be effective, pre-training must have changed the features or the embeddings of the inputs uh, during pre-training. Another very popular uh, fine tuning scheme is to train the whole network during fine tuning. Uh, here, you know, we, we don't have something as obvious as this, where, you know, if you don't uh, change the embeddings, then uh, it doesn't in, uh, improve the total fine tuning. It could be that the weights moves in some subtle way that it doesn't change the embedding, but uh, causes uh, the, the fine tuning stage to be more effective. Uh, however, uh, we can use a more sophisticated argument to say that uh, this is also the case here. Uh, if total fine tuning works uh, better than you know starting from random initialization, then uh, it must be the case that the, the features are learned during pre-training. Okay. Um, so now you know, let's jump to the uh, other side of the fence. Let's look at uh, what is the uh, pop, what is the one of the popular uh, theoretical explanations of neural networks so far. And this is uh, a theory called neural tangent kernel. Um, so the idea is very simple. Uh, you do a naive first order tail expansion of your neural network around the initial parameters. So here uh, in my equation here, the data represent parameters, X represents input, F is the neural network function, and data zero is the initial parameters. All right, so here it is a very naive first order expansion. Uh, where on the right data mass data zero is the change in the parameters. And this uh, NABLA data is the, 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 the gradients of F with respect to the parameters evaluated at the initial parameters. Uh, if you rearrange the terms a little bit and use the uh, gradient descent relation of loss and the, the, the gradient, uh, you will see that uh, this is equivalent to saying that the change in F in any one step of uh, gradient update can be expressed as a kernel times the loss derivative, uh, where the kernel is given by the uh, inner product uh, is induced by this uh, the gradient, uh, the primary gradients of functions and initialization. Okay, so uh, by the way, you know if you have any questions, feel free to shout it out at any given time. Um, so this is very nice, right? Because it it makes the whole super nonlinear evolution of neural networks something that's linear, especially uh, if you consider uh, the case when the loss function is a square loss. So on the right here, this is a kind of neat visualization of the optimization landscape in function space uh, for the, the, this neural tangent kernel limit. And the takeaway here is that as width increases, the loss scape becomes more and more quadratic uh, because of this uh, kernel limit. And uh, as a result, uh, the evolution of the network during training is very easy to analyze in the function space because now you just have essentially a linear equation, especially uh, if you have a square loss. And consequently, you also get generalization results using you know, a vast literature of generalization of kernel methods. However, a very, very big drawback in the context of what we discussed just now is that uh, the NTK limit does not learn features uh, in the sense that it, the, the infinite width a limit of this network uh, doesn't have uh, the embeddings that are changing uh, with respect to training time in a, in a non-trivial way. Okay, so I'll uh, talk a little bit more about why this is the case, but I think probably some of you have some intuition for why this is, it's kind of like a folk knowledge in, in one form or another. Um, so here's a very uh, visual example of this. Uh, and this is some experiments we did uh, incorporating uh, what the, the, the feature, the infinite width feature learning limit that we'll talk about uh, later in the talk. Uh, so here uh, we have a, a Wartovec embedding uh, trained on text eight, which is some, some data set, don't worry about it. Uh, so in the middle here, um, oh, actually uh, before that, let me just say a little bit about Wartovec in case uh, you're not aware of uh, this literature. So Wartovec is essentially the really the first large scale pre-training task in natural language processing in the deep learning age. Uh, 
Um, so as such, it's a precursor to BERT. Uh, and the objective here is to learn uh, word embeddings. So embeddings of words into vector spaces uh, such that uh, semantically close words have uh, geome uh, geometrically close vectors. Um, so here we have uh, trained word to vec models for, you know, uh, with 64 neural network and also in the NDK limit and as well as the, the feature, learn feature learning limit that I'll explain later. Um, but in the middle, this is just a normal word to vec and uh, here we uh, we plotted the PCA of uh, words corresponding to the common U.S. cities and states in uh, this uh, validation data set, and um, what you see is that uh, there's kind of a gradual separation, a fuzzy separation of the city words from the state words. Now, if you look on the left, uh, look at the New York tangent kernel limit. Uh, essentially, the there's no semantical information at all that's in the embedding. The embeddings are essentially random uh, and there's no pattern at all. Now, finally, uh, if you look to the right uh, where uh, we had the feature learning limit, which um, you can think of it as just like taking the middle, uh, middle neural network with 64, but taking width to infinity. Um, in this case, we actually have more uh, semantical separation uh, of these words than the with 64 case. So what this demonstrates is one that um, what well, NTK uh, doesn't learn features. Uh, it tells you this in a very visual way uh, in contrast to the uh, finite width neural network which does learn semantic information. Uh, and finally, the feature learning limit uh, learns even, is able to learn even better the semantic information uh, in the words, in the sense that um, they, uh, in the PCA, you can see that uh, the, the clusters separate much more than the finite width case. Um, so uh, so I, I discussed what is word to vec just now. Uh, and uh, remember that uh, I started this talk by talking about pre-training and transfer learning. So word to vec is also uh, falls into this category so um, in, the, in the original literature, the primary way of assessing whether uh, a word to vec embedding is good or not is via this uh, word analogy task, which you probably have heard of. Um, is, is this, this task asks the question of the kind, what to a queen is this a man to a woman? So the answer to this question, of course, is king. And uh, given a set of word embeddings, the way you would answer this question is, you take uh, the word embedding for man, and then you subtract woman, and then you add queen. And in the end, you get a vector, and then you look at which uh, words uh, embedding is the closest to that vector, and then you return that word. So uh, ideally, you know, very good set of embeddings would, uh, would be able to answer this question more accurately using this geometric construction, uh, whereas you know, a less good one would just kind of give you random words. Okay, so on the right, uh, I'm plotting the, um, the uh, accuracy, the, the word analogy accuracy over the course of pre-training. So on x-axis x -axis is the number epochs. Um, you know, I have a bunch of different curves here. So uh, three curves here are for finite neural networks. Each of them correspond to different width or different embedding dimension. So it goes from 64, uh, so two to six, 64 or two to 10. To, uh, to, to 2 to 10 or 1,024. So these are the finite neural networks. And as the color gets darker, the width becomes larger. In addition, I have uh, trained uh, the feature learning limit. Again, I'll talk about what that is uh, later. Um, and finally, I have the NTK and GP limit. So the first thing you can notice is that the NTK slash GP limit has zero accuracy on word analogy. And that's, uh, you know, you, as you can guess from the previous visualization, is because NTK essentially doesn't learn any meaningful features. So he essentially just randomly guesses. Uh, and because the vocabulary size is so large, it's about 70K, random guessing essentially gets zero uh, on this graph. And the other notable observation you can make is that as the width increases um, from uh, two to six to two to 10, 
uh, the performance monotonically increases and approaches the infinite width uh, limit, the feature learning limit from below. So uh, this suggests that you know the feature learning limit is really the right limit to look at when you want to say something about feature learning. Um, we also have results on meta learning, but uh, for the sake of brevity, uh, we're going to skip it. But it's essentially the conclusion is the same. All right, so. So here uh, I've already talked about uh, some empirical results to convince you that um, at least empirically, uh, when we compute out the feature learning limit, uh, this, this, is the, this is the right thing to look at. So now I'm gonna uh, take a step back and tell you a bit about like what is the theory behind all of this. And so here I'm gonna just summarize uh, our theoretical contributions and why you should care about it. And then uh, later I'll, I'll lay out an outline for, for this talk. So, uh, we first of all, um, we essentially classify all viable infinite width limits into feature learning and kernel limits. Um, second, uh, we identify the maximal quote unquote uh, feature learning limit. And this maximal feature learning limit is going to be the one that we actually compute. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I want to talk about, I would, I would talk about. Um, the tensor programs technique for deriving the equations of these limits. And in general, essentially the limit of any neural computation that's prevalent in deep learning. So why should you care about uh, these results? Um, so first of all, it gives you a framework for studying feature learning in over-parameterized neural networks. Um, secondly, uh, it derives concrete formulas for training, for like actually training feature learning infinite width neural networks in a variety of settings. And uh, finally, uh, the tensor programs technique, in my opinion, really solves the problem of taking infinite width limits, which has been tackled in a haphazard way uh, in a variety of works previously, you know, like the neural tangent kernel limit, the GP kernel limit, and uh, the mean field limit. But this framework kind of unifies everything into a single, uh, single machinery. And once you know this machinery, you can just, you know, solve a lot of different problems with it. Um, and let me just remind you that uh, as we've seen in our experimental results, the, this maximal feature learning limit is really the right limit to look at. All right, so let me outline uh, uh, what the, the plan is for the rest of this talk. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, parameterization of neural network first. And, uh, and, and the reason is that it will have essentially a mapping between parameterizations and infinite width limits and talking about natural class of parameterizations give us uh, a natural class of limits to look at. Uh, then secondly, I'm gonna classify these parameterizations and their limits into the feature learning kind and the kernel kind. And third, I'm gonna tell you about the, the maximal feature learning limit, uh, which is the limit that I actually compute on WordEvec and on meta learning. And uh, finally, I'll delve into the details of how to derive um, the limit for the maximal feature learning limit as well as uh, other kinds of limits. All right, so let me start with the parameterizations. Um, so uh, so, uh, so let's, let's do some setup by considering an uh, L hidden layer perceptron. So uh, let me just go through the notation a little bit. Um, so the big L is depth or number of hidden layers. Uh, small d is input dimension. Output dimension is assumed one for simplicity. Width is taken to be n. Nonlinearity is v. Input is i. Uh, we have um, L plus one matrices uh, in the network. And we assume there's no bias for simplicity. The h's will denote the pre-activations uh, of uh, the network. And then the x's will denote the activations. So access will always, always be phi of some uh, h, okay? And finally, uh, the network outputs uh, wl plus one times x. So the, the output network is linear after some embedding. All right, so now let's talk about uh, parameterizations of such kind of uh, multi-layer perceptrons. So this, the parameterization we're concerned with are called ABC parameterizations. 
uh, and the reason is that they're given by a set of numbers, A and B for each layer, and a single C for the entire network. And the definition is as follows. Uh, we parameterize each uh, big W, so the W is here, uh, as some multiplier times some small W, where the small W is trained instead of big W. Uh, and then the multiplier here is the power of N, the width, uh, and uh, the power of this is negative AL, in this, this uh, A in the ABC prime translation. Okay, secondly, um, the initialization of each small w is given by uh, the uh, a Gaussian of mean zero and the variance n to the negative two bl. Or in other words, the standard deviation is n to the negative bl. So you know, in other words, bl is a, a indicator of the magnitude of the initial w's, the, the small w's. Um, finally, the uh, HE learning rate is on the order of n to the negative c uh, for some, uh, yeah. And uh, so, so eta here is just so that you can uh, adjust some constant uh, that's with independent. Okay, so uh, here uh, um, I cast some of the parameterizations in the literature into this form. Um, on the left, uh, you have uh, the ABC definitions to remind you uh, how, how they define. Uh, on the right, we have uh, three uh, parameterizations that are prevalent in the literature. So uh, let's first look at the standard one. Uh, so standard by standard, I mean the PyTorch default. And uh, in this case, uh, you know, we, we don't have any explicit multipliers. So that's why AL a zero for every layer. Um, the PyTorch default uses the fan initialization. So uh, for layer L greater than one, uh, that means that your initialization has um, a variance one over the fan N. So in this case, one over N. And this implies that BL is one half. And finally, in the, uh, uh, in, the in the input layer, um, we set BL to be zero uh, because here we're gonna ignore dependencies on input dimension D, which we think of as a constant, right? Because uh, in general, you the dimension of your data is fixed, uh, e even though you can vary the hidden dimension of your neural network at well. Uh, and uh, the, the C here is zero because uh, the learning rate, of course, does not change with width uh, in the PyTorch parameterization. Um, in the NTK parameterization, uh, which is the, the parameterization that induces the NTK limit that uh, we talked about earlier in the slides, uh, this parameterization essentially is very similar to standard parameterization, but it flips A, L, and B, L, right? So if you look at A, L, and NTK, it's the same as B, L in standard uh, and vice versa. Um, so if you've seen this before, this should uh, look familiar to you. And uh, finally, we have uh, the mean field parameterization, which I won't say very much about here, but if you are familiar with this literature, you can take a look at, at this table and uh, double check that this makes sense to you. Um, okay, so before I move on, uh, let me just remark that uh, this ABC parameterization uh, has a single C for the entire network. So you might look like it's kind of restrictive uh, but actually by varying AL and BL while fixing AL plus BL, uh, we can effectively give each layer its own learning rate. So um, for example, if you increase AL but you decrease BL by the same amount, then that's the same as decreasing uh, the learning rate for that layer by two times that amount. So this is something that's very easy you can check. So uh, the point being that the ABC parameterization is actually a fairly general, fairly general notion. Uh, that encompasses uh, essentially all of the parameterizations that are talked about in the literature. Okay, so I want to pause here uh, for any questions. Am I like, also let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Okay, so let me move on. Uh, uh, question? Could you ask a question? Yes. Uh, so 
their way to understand the choice of uh, uh, A and B in the NTK in terms of the the um, in, in terms of the effective learning rate you get. Like, is, is there something like the NTK parameterization gives you the same learning rate across all layers or something? Like, is there a way to understand it like that? Uh, not quite. So yeah. So essentially. Uh, the last layer of the NTK parameterization gets too much gradient. And this is actually the reason that you cannot do feature learning in the NTK parameterization without blowing up the training dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, to your question, yeah, so not quite. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Um, right. Sorry, in, I, yeah. hey, Greg. Um, yeah, what's up? Do, something people say about the NTK thing is that you basically let the learning rate go to zero or something along the, is that, is that true or is, is that seen in the way you've parameterized um, it? Yeah, so it's a very good question. I think this is like a point of confusion uh, in the literature. So uh, actually everything I do in this talk and in the paper is about discrete time. So in some sense, my learning rate is never very close to zero. Uh, but this this behavior, the kernel behavior, the feature learning behavior, really comes from um, kind of yeah, like you know, kind of like the previous question. It really comes from kind of the relative gradient magnitude of the last layer versus like the previous layers. So um, the NTK parameterization, uh, th th there's an intuition that you when you use small learning rate, you get NTK, you get kernel behavior. Um, but this is not actually not quite right because for example in the mean field limit you can also use very small learning rate but it, it doesn't do that kind of thing uh you, you more has to do with um again like how much last layer how much gradient the last layer gets versus how much uh gradient the earlier layers get if your last layer gets too much gradient then you you cannot use a very large learning rate because then like your lodges will blow up and then your like entire training dynamics will blow up um, so this forces you to use a very small learning rate, and which means that like the the body of the network doesn't get enough gradient to change the features. Interesting. Hey, thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? All right, let me move on. Okay, so let me just briefly say something about why do we care about the parameterizations. Um, so it turns out each parameter, each parameterization emits an infinite width limit. So pictorially, you can think of uh, you know uh, taking the infinite width limit as a mapping between uh, a from parameterizations to infinite width uh, dynamics. Uh, this mapping is usually not injective or surjective, but uh, you know essentially looking at this natural class of ABC parameterizations, uh, we isolate a natural class of limits by looking at kind of the image of this taking the infinite width limit. And this class of uh, limits include the NTK limit, the GP limit, the mean field limit, uh, et cetera. And of course, we'll see also includes this uh, maximal feature learning limit that we're gonna talk about. Um, and the other reason is kind of practical. Uh, and this is because, you know, kind of from the very beginning of this deep learning age, uh, we have the GLORA initialization and later we had Hood initialization and recently we had something like fix up. And these are all, essentially all uh, initialization or parameterization schemes that uh, allow you to train bigger, uh, deeper networks. So uh, finding out what parameterization has good properties is actually uh, a very important thing, especially you know, now that we're kind of in an arms race to train bigger and bigger neural networks. All right, so that's uh, the introduction on the parameterizations of neural networks. Now, let me talk about um, how do we understand them in, the, in, ter in terms of the classification of them. So first, uh, let me get something out of the way, which is that you know we won't only want to consider meaningful uh, parameterizations in the sense that parameterizations that yield meaningful limits. And uh, there are two properties, instability and triviality, which uh, yield non-meaningful limits. So let me uh, give you, uh, let, me, let me describe what I mean by that. So uh, first, if the learning rate is too large with respect to width, uh, 
you know, in, in the language of the ABC prime transition, this means that C is too small. Uh, if you look at the upper right corner, I reproduce the equation for the definition of C. Uh, so if learning rate is too large in that sense, then uh, lodges or pre-activations will blow up as width goes to infinity during training. So like concretely, if you like think about what happens if you take one step at SGD, then usually uh, if your learning rate is too large with respect to width, then as your width goes to infinity, after one step, your lodges will blow up. Uh, and if this is the case, uh, we say this ABC parameterization is unstable. Uh, on the other side, uh, if learning rate is too small with respect to width, i.e. C is too big, then the neural network function doesn't evolve in the infinite width limit. And in this case, we say this ABC parameterization is trivial. And of course, uh, only non-trivial and stable ABC parameterizations are meaningful. So we want to look at parameterizations whose limit uh, both will evolve over time and also doesn't blow up to infinity, right? OK, so uh, the main theorem for the classification is called the dynamical dichotomy theorem. So uh, first, it says that any non-trivial and stable ABC parameterization yields a discrete time infinite width limit. Uh, second, it says that when trained for any finite amount of time, uh, this limit exhibits exactly one of the following properties. So you can allow the embedding uh, XL, the final layer embedding of the input Xi to evolve non-trivially. Uh, in, in this case, we say this limit is feature learning. Uh, or the other property is that this limit is described by a kernel gradient descent equation in function space. So by kernel gradient descent, I mean that there exists some kernel K such that the change in the function F uh, is equal to this kernel K times the last derivative, All right? So uh, if you recall the NTK equations, this is uh, very, very much the same. Um, so the feature, uh, the feature learning limit in the depth equal to one case has an example, uh, the mean field limit. Even though I think previously this, this is kind of fuzzy, uh, I don't think it was very clarified in literature, but um, you, can, you can work, you, you can do some calculation and uh, this will be very clear. Um, in the kernel limit, of course, uh, an example is the NTK uh, limit uh, as well as the GP limit. Okay, so you know some of you might look at the theorem and be like, okay, isn't this obvious? If you don't do feature learning, aren't you aren't you definitely in the kernel limit? Uh, so this is actually kind of subtle. Uh, what this what what is ruled out, for example, is things that are higher order generalizations of NTK dynamics. Um, so for example, this is some just some equation I made up. Uh, uh, so this just says that you know change in f is equal to uh, some uh, k two is like a rank three tensor, and I, I contracted with uh, the uh, ten like tensor squared of uh, the last derivative. So uh, yeah, the, the way I wrote this is a direct generalization of this NTK or the kernel gradient descent equation to a higher order uh, multiplier. So uh, so here, the dependence of the delta f is quadratic in the last derivative. Uh, what the theorem says, this says uh, is that um, these higher order generalizations of NTK dynamics are ruled out. Um, and let me just remark that some of you might ask, okay, isn't the near tangent hierarchy an example of a higher order uh, NTK dynamics? Uh, so so the, my reply to that is, uh, NTH actually is the same as NTK if you train for any finite amount of time. Uh, the corrections to NTK are all vanishing with respect to N. So uh, from the perspective of this theorem, NTH doesn't give you anything new uh, from NTK. Um, yeah, and the other thing is that like this, this, this uh, rooting out statement concerns equations that are self-consistent and doesn't depend on N. Right, because we're at the infinite width limit. So it doesn't make sense for the equation to depend on N in any way. Um, so NTH is not of this form. Um, 
Okay, so this is an interesting consequence. Uh, what is ruled out, right? The higher organizations of NTK dynamics. Uh, another interesting consequence is that if you want to do feature learning, uh, then the neural network function must be identically zero initialization in the infinite width limit. So this is kind of interesting because um, you know one of the uses of uh, NTK or the GP limit is uh, that you have uncertainty quantification properties based on the non-trivial GP initialization. And in the NTK case during training, you propagate this GP uh, over the course of training. But uh, interestingly, in any feature learning limit, uh, you cannot, uh, you don't have this kind of a fluctuation for you to use as uh, uncertainty quantification. So, um, so people who work on this kind of thing, I think it's something interesting to think about. Um, so uh, here is a geometric, right? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so how should I think of that there, uh, that these generalization of NTK are, are ruled out um, in the sense that like, uh, what kind of principle like should I look at if I, if I write down some modification of NTK or something else? Um, yeah, um, okay. so good. Uh, so essentially the, the way uh, it works is that um, if you have a dynamics that's that can be described in the function space. So you have some dynamics that purely depends on f as a function. So it doesn't know anything about the internals of f, like the, the embedding, the pre-activation or activations of the neural network. If you just have a function that purely depends on, so if you have an evolution that purely depends on the function value of f, uh, and this function, this, this dependence is not in this kernel gradient descent form in the sense that, for example, uh, the dependence uh, of delta f uh, is linear in the loss derivative. If that's not the case, then uh, then it's not a valid limit. Okay, that makes sense. So so again, so in other words, if you have some dynamics in the function space, and it doesn't have this kernel gradient descent form, then it, it's not a valid limit, at least of some ABC parameterization. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to understand uh, how strong this is an assumption. Yeah, that you have to have this ABC parameterization. Uh, yeah. I mean, I. I think it's not a very strong assumption. It's. It's a very natural um, kind of parameterization. I don't. I think in practice. Uh, I don't think anybody in practice uses something other than ABC parameterizations. So in that sense, it's a very natural assumption. Okay. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you can construct exotic parameterizations that give other limits, but, you know, whether that's actually useful or not, I don't know. And I also asked a question concerning this. <clears throat> so, I mean, one assumption that that's in there is that you don't have biases. So if you included biases, you would need something like an ABCDE classific uh, parameterization where you sort of also include um, N to the minus C and in front of the like the biases you learn and and in the initialization of the bias something like n to the minus 2d or something uh or are you assuming that these are fixed at the edge of chaos such that they are not new parameters uh, so, so yeah you can generalize this abc parameterization to any architecture so uh uh it, i mean it's not a difficulty to introduce bias uh i i don't do it just because i want to keep it simple but you can uh, do it for any architecture uh, I mean, you can do tra transformers, whatever, ResNet. Um, I, I don't think biases change the picture. Uh, yeah. I think you get the same results if you add bias. Um, another question. Is something like orthogonal initialization included in the ABC parameterization? Uh, yeah, very good. So uh, r right now it is not uh, in the sense that I, speci I specifically uh, require the initialization to be a Gaussian initialization, uh, which you know makes sense because uh, you know people usually either use Gaussian or uniform or truncated Gaussian. But in any case, you know because of at least you know hypothesized universality, I don't think you know the specific distribution matters. But as long as you do ID uh, ID initialization, I think uh, you would fall under this theorem. Now I think uh, you know the orthogonal. Uh, Initialization is an interesting question, and uh, I do I do know 
a way to prove something about uh, orthogonal initialization, but I haven't thought this through. But I believe um, something similar to this term would still hold for orthogonal. I mean, like, so, okay, so, so in particular, what I believe to be true is that uh, the infinite width limit, if you have orthogonal uh, initialization, will be different than if you have Gaussian initialization, especially when you do feature learning. Um, however, I do not believe that this dichotomy theorem will be falsified in that setting. I think this is like a coarse enough theorem that even if you change the initialization, uh, you shouldn't change this theorem too much. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, will you be defining non-trivial, non-trivial stable parameterization exactly? You mentioned that C, you know, when C is too small, too large, but yes. it's probably in relationship with other parameters, right? Uh, okay, so yeah, very good. So uh, stable, um, so so non, so okay. Uh, so I don't have a formal definition here, but the way I define it in the paper, uh, for, okay, let's take trivial. So so a parameterization is trivial uh, if uh, you know for any like training uh, I don't know SGD sequence of uh, batches, any batches, any sequence of batches, any learn any um, uh, constant scaling of learning rate. So you you keep the the value of c, you keep the dependence on n, but you uh, you are allowed to change eta. Um, any uh, reasonable loss function, whatever, uh, the the function at time t for any finite t is exactly the same as a function at time zero in the infinite n limit. So that defines trivial. Uh, for stable, uh, uh, yeah, for stable, the definition is that uh, for for some sequence of uh, you know mini batches, some choice of eta, uh, some choice of loss function, uh, after some step of SGD, the the function uh, f will blow up to infinity uh, in the limit and goes to infinity. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, Bert. Uh, I have yeah. a question regarding. Sure. Um, the, because you are always talk about uh, uh, infinite width limit, right? Uh, so you said you want to feature learning in, in, this, in this limit. But what I'm wondering that can we uh, achieve also achieve some feature learning by considering, for example, NTK in the finite width regime, and maybe the because the weight uh, the kernel will also involves somehow, so that can also be concluded as a, a kind of feature learning. Do you think that that approach is also reasonable, like in, in finite yeah. weight limit? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, so, so okay. So practically speaking, I think any finite neural network will exhibit feature learning, mm -hmm. and the way I'm looking at it now is that the right the right way to think about it in the over parameterized setting, even if you're finite, is always to think about it in in relation to how close it is to some feature learning limit. Uh, because I think any analysis you make will eventually have to depend very carefully on the way you scale things. And once you start to think about how you scale things, you're essentially thinking about in the infinite width limit, um, you know, how, how uh, the feature change or how the feature kernel change, or how the neural tension kernel change. Uh, so, so, so the answer, direct answer to your question is yes, you can think about, you know, finite neural networks and how things change, but, uh, uh, I feel like if you start uh, thinking that way, you will end up thinking kind of uh, very close to how you would think in the infinite width limit anyway, but you kind of quanti um, quantify everything in bounds, but uh, the, the qualitative results are the same. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I wonder that, did, did you uh, do some experiments or other do some experiments in, for very, very wide neural networks, like, uh, you know, not reasonably wide. Uh, so. Uh, for, mm -hmm. for this kind of wide neural network, like approaching the infinite width limit, uh, does it still exhibit some kind of feature learning in practice? You mean like NTK in the NTK limit? Um, in the NTK parameterization? Yeah, I mean, you use the finite width neural network, just construct a finite, very wide finite width mm -hmm. neural network. And yeah. you train it either in the NTK parameterization or standard one. And yeah. does this still exhibit kind of feature learning in its last layer? 
or it's just a yeah I, I believe yeah. yeah I believe uh you should I mean even if you do something okay so so here's what I believe uh definitely the wider you go the less the features will move but if you're as long as you're not exactly at the limit you can do something to make the features move more uh you can um yeah like uh you can train you can try to train longer but i guess what i worry about is just that the function will converge uh before you train for very long so then it's kind of stuck in the feature learning solution oh sorry in the kernel solution um but uh okay so so i think another uh way to tackle your question is um i mean there's for example the uh literature on uh implicit bias, which you can think of as like, you fix the width and then you take the infinite time limit. And then you can look at how the width changes that limit, uh, changes that infinite time limit. Yeah, so that's also a very interesting way to look at it. And this is kind of a, that's kind of orthogonal to what I'm talking about here, which is that I'm taking the infinite width limit and then I'm keeping time fixed or times growing slowly compared to width. Oh, okay. You you also scale your uh, training time. Okay, I got it. No, yeah, I, no, I don't. I don't scale my training time. Uh, this is all discrete time. I'm just saying that. Uh, uh, I'm just saying that. Uh, I, for example, I look at what the function looks like after a hundred steps of SGD. Oh, okay. right. The SGD. This number of SGD steps is fixed. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So, okay, you, you can say it's discrete uh, SGD. So, does it uh, involve something like the large learning rate? Because you have large learning rate, uh, people said uh, you, you, so uh, your initialization is far away from your uh, converged solution. You, you know that, like, you, you, you basically escape from some uh, value of the initialization. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, it is the case. Uh, it is the case that uh, in the feature learning limit, you are going to go very far from the initialization. I see. Uh, okay. In the kernel limit, you're going to stay very close to the initialization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, let me keep going because uh, we've uh, used a lot of time on this slide. Um, okay. Uh, so here's a character of the space of ABC parameterizations. Um, so, so this uh, the ambient space you can think of as a high dimensional space, where the axes are the a, b's, and c's. Um, so, uh, most of the space will be unstable or trivial parameterizations. Uh, within the space, there's a polyhedron uh, that consists of non-trivial and stable parameterizations, um, and uh, you know within these. Uh, two facets form the feature learning parameterizations and then the rest form the kernel regime. So uh, this, this may contrast with what you thought when you saw the dichotomy theorem that uh, the, the space of non-trivial stable parameterizations is kind of partitioned equally between feature learning and kernel regime. But geometric speaking, this is actually not true. The feature learning parameterizations actually form a cold dimension one subspace. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, the neural tangent parameterization forms a specific vertex in the kernel regime polytope. Uh, the standard parameterization uh, with the constant learning rate will actually be unstable. But if you use the largest stable learning rate, which is one over width, then uh, it falls on an edge of the kernel regime polytope. Um, and then in the feature learning regime, uh, we have this uh, vertex at the very top, which corresponds to uh, the maximal update parameterization, which I'll introduce very soon. Uh, but as an appetizer, uh, let me remark that when depth equal to one in the sense of number of hidden layers equals one, so two layer neural network, uh, the mean field parameterization is equivalent to the maximal update. They're not the same, but they're equivalent. Now I'll explain a little bit later what that means. <clears throat> um, and uh, very briefly before I move on, let me just give you some intuition why NTK and standard parameterization don't learn features. And I said this kind of already, uh, the last layer weights get too much gradient. So relative to the weights in the body, if you use a very large learning rate, the last layer will blow up, like the largest will blow up. 
uh, which prevents you from use a large enough learning rate to cause the body of the network to move enough for feature learning to occur. So I mean, so the intuition is really very simple. Okay, so so this finishes the dichotomy of parameterizations. Um, now let me talk about uh, the maximal feature learning limit, which is the limit that I actually compute on word effect and meta learning. Um, so the easier way to describe uh, this parameterization is to start with a standard parameterization and modify it. So uh, there are two main modifications. The, the most important one is modifying the last layer. So the modification is to divide the logics by square root of n and use a constant learning rate. Uh, in terms of a and c, it's given by a plus one equal to one half and c equal to zero. And more concretely, uh, if we look at the equation for the last uh, layer, uh, it's given by the output, the logist equal to one over square root of n times small, a small w l plus one times the final layer embedding of the network, where this last layer weight matrix is sampled with, var with variance one over n, so kind of standard Fanion uh, initialization. And uh, it turns out that this alone suffices to enable feature learning. And this is consistent with the remark I just made about why NTK and standard conversations don't learn features, which is that the last layer gets too much gradient. So by having this explicit one over square root of n uh, right before output, you, we essentially uh, decrease the amount of gradient that the last layer gets. And this allows us to use a larger learning rate overall. And uh, that allows the body network to, to learn sufficiently. Um, the other thing uh, we do is uh, modification in the first layer uh, and uh, the purpose here is that the standard parameterization actually has a property that the first layer gets too little gradient. Uh, so when every other layer starts learning, the first layer is actually kind of fixed at initialization. So we fix this uh, by just increasing the gradient in the first layer by setting a1 equal to negative one half and b1 equal to one half. So concretely, what that means is uh, h1, the pre-activation, the first pre-activation vector is equal to square root of n times w1 times the input, where w1 is sampled according to fan out. So the variance is one over n. Uh, again, uh, having this first layer uh, modification enables feature learning in every layer in the sense that uh, h1 now uh, will change over the course of training. Um, and the last layer uh, is the most important one, which uh, enables feature learning uh, in the entire network. Okay, um, and uh, uh, very briefly, uh, the reason I call it maximal update is because it is maximally feature learning in the sense that every layer learns features, i.e. the pre-activations and activations for every layer will evolve the unit training. And uh, this is the reason uh, I put, I draw the uh, maximal update uh, vertex at the very top, because I mean, you can kind of think of like the Y axis as kind of a, measuring the amount of feature learning, if you will. Um, okay, very quickly, um, it's kind of kind of aside, but uh, it will tie back later. Uh, there is a one dimension of the genesis in the ABC space. So in other words, like two parameterizations can look different, but they actually correspond to the same dynamics. And the reason is very simple. Uh, if you, you know, increase A by some amount, but decrease B by the same amount, then you're effectively uh, decreasing the learning rate for that layer by two times theta. So if I uh, do this modification for the same data for every layer, and then I scale uh, up the learning rate by n to the two data, then uh, I essentially uh, have the exact same uh, training dynamics, even in finite time. Um, so, so this is uh, one dimension of the genesis in the ABC space. And uh, this is why I said earlier that the mean field parameterization when depth equal one uh, is equivalent to the maximum update. So they're related by this uh, one dimension degeneracy. So here's a summary um, of uh, all the parameterizations that we've talked about uh, in this talk so far. Um, so, uh, the the standard parameterization uh, as is in the in PyTorch is not stable because learning is too large. Uh, 
um, the, ma the maximal stable learning rate is one over n, which corresponds to C value one. And in this case, uh, it is non-trivial and stable, but it's not feature learning. Um, yeah, on the right, we have the maximum update uh, that we've seen just now. Uh, like I said, it's equivalent to mean field um, parameterization when depth equals one. Uh, where, you know, with this one dimension degeneracy, if you set data equal one half, you will recover mean field from maximum update. Uh, so they both do feature learning, uh, of course, uh, but mean field, at least in the literature, is only defined for depth one. Uh, whereas maximum update is defined for any depth and really any architecture. Um, okay, so uh, let me pause here for questions. I'm um, actually like, I guess we're out of time at 12. Uh, I have more material, but let me just pause here for a question. Hi. So. Hi. Um... I like to uh, use NTK parameterization with Adam in practice. And if you pretend that Adam only normalizes the gradients, would that mean that I effectively get something similar to maximum update parameterization? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, everything here concerns only SGD uh, and it's very specific to SGD. Uh, so Adam has, a, has different scaling properties and we'll talk about it in a later paper. But yeah, if you use Atom with NTK, uh, let me think. Uh, I definitely, I, I, I believe either you blow up uh, where, you're, where you're in the um, uh, feature learning region. I don't quite remember how the math goes, but it definitely, if you use Atom with NTK, you're not in the kernel region. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I have a question about the, um, the speed at which the widths uh, tend to infinity in your internal layers. Yeah. Um, do they uh, tend to infinity at the same speed? Uh, so like in, for different layers, you mean? Sorry, for different, uh, yeah, for example, uh, uh, do you take into account the case where uh, one layer could tend at speed n and the other one at speed n square, for example? Or, okay, yeah, yeah uh, that's a good question. Uh, so here I assume all layers go to infinity at the same rate. So like they're all linear. I mean, like you, you can't have a constant factor between different widths, but they're all linear. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I guess I haven't really thought about what happens uh, in this other case that you're talking about. Uh, but I mean, I expect if you do n squared first, then you just, you can just kind of replace that layer with the infinite width limit, and then you do the analysis again. Uh, so I expect probably something similar as what I'm presenting here with Holy in that case. Okay, uh, I was asking this question because it's, it looks like uh, you need a parameter, uh, um, uh, you need a parameter al equal to zero for the internal layers and different of zero uh, for the layers in contact with finite width uh, layers, like the input layer and then you output layers. That was uh, the reason why I, I asked uh, this question. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, the reason, you know, in the maximum update, ALs are different for input and output is just because uh, they are both, uh, like essentially vectors, right? Like in the sense that the input and upper layers only have one dimension that is inf infinite, the other dimension is fixed uh, at the data dimension. So effectively it is a vector. And for that reason, we have uh, different scalings for them. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the reason, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. I was wondering if you have any intuition as to why uh, feature learning doesn't occur in the, with a neural network Gaussian process, given that all the weights are sort of randomized together. Uh, like, uh, what do you mean exactly by uh, the Gaussian process? Like, you mean like training the last layer of a network? Uh, like the, the Bayesian neural networks interpretation where... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
like I seen, so you're saying like you know initialization given a wide neural network it's approximately a Gaussian process and uh, if I just do kind of the, the GP inference using that why does not why does that not correspond to uh, uh, feature learning yeah or, or I, you were saying that feature like features don't emerge with a neural network guessing process when done like that right in my understanding uh, it's not, it doesn't emerge, it doesn't change from the initialization. So like, you know, right, when you, when you have the NGP, you have a set of features which are from the random neural network initialization. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when you do inference, it kind of corresponds to just changing like a linear set of weights on those features, but it doesn't change the features themselves. Hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. Um, so if you don't train it via grid, if you don't train the maximal update uh, featureization via gradient descent, though, uh, if you just look at the initialization, it's still a GP, no? Uh, with, with the feature riser or like, yeah. what do you mean? Well, if, if you look at the like distribution of our functions, uh, with this maximal update parameterization, is it still a GP uh, in the prior, right? Like the, the way you've parameterized it, sure, when you do gradient descent, it won't be a GP anymore. But if you don't train it at all, is it is it still a GP prior or? Like or you not? only train the last layer or something? No, you don't train anything. You just look at the distribution of functions oh, okay. at I, initialization. I oh, I see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like in if you just look at the first four paths they're all like the same like all these okay. so the, all of them are gps if you don't train them uh so more precisely if you look at uh, a pre-activation like a pre-activation not the output yes in pre-activation will, will be a gp of variance order one uh mm -hmm. which is you know what you expect uh right. in the maximal update parameterization if you look at the output of the function mm -hmm. this is I mean, it is the GP, but the GP is vanishing with n. Like the variance is one over n in the. Oh, okay, and that's why you said it's zero uniformly at the initialization. Yeah, yeah, but you only apply to the uh, output in the internal network. Everything yeah. is still order one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, other questions? So let me. All right, so uh, um, I can I can keep going, uh, but I don't know who like who's interested in hearing more. Like the next thing I'll talk about is the tensor programs technique for driving the limit. So in particular, I'll actually talk about how um, the limit for word to vec is calculated. Uh, you know, we can stop here if like this is not interesting to people, or. Uh, sure. Greg, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in hearing more, and I think other people might just sort of leave at this point if they have other obligations, they can drop out. But um, yeah, I mean, you gave them opportunity to ask questions so far. If there are further questions of people who have to leave, please be free to ask them now. And otherwise, I'd say we just uh, continue. Greg, I had one high level question. Sure. Uh, which is uh, the one of the things that's nice about the MTK style limits is. Uh, as you pointed out, you get uh, potentially convex optimizations in function space. Is there any um, uh, computational guarantees for these these other limits? The you feature mean optimization limits? guarantees? Right. Can you actually? Uh, are there many optimum or single optimum or anything like that that one could say? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm working on something like that. Uh, so I don't know. I believe there are multiple optimums, but uh, I think under certain conditions, you can show that uh, if you are at a local minimum, then it's a global, it's a global minimum. So, uh, so in that case, you know, there's no spurious local minimum under some conditions. Uh, but I believe there are going to be multiple. I mean, it's not going to be like a convex thing. You know, there's going to be multiple global minimums. And there's then there's no longer a function space view that one could take. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like the feature learning lim the feature learning limit is kind of exactly the the space of limits which cannot be described purely in the function space. Mm 
can I can I ask a quick follow up on that? So like sure. when when you say that they cannot be described purely in a function space, like what do you mean? Because I mean you could describe the evolution of the function somehow. So what you mean is that that evolution does not cannot be in any way only described as depending on the functions at previous time steps and so on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. You have to know something about the internal of the network. Okay. So, so for example, in this, in that limit, or like in the maximal feature learning, the function at initialization is, is zero, but the internal in, in, in activations may not be zero, and that's why you may end up with different functions, like stochastically. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. And, and do do you no longer have the property that uh, all random initializations are going to lead to the same function? Like, is are the dynamics deterministic? Yeah, so uh, so it's deterministic in the sense that, uh, like at, at time t, uh, if you look at the function at time t, you fix the training procedure, everything, uh, you let the width go to infinity, at time t, the function will be exactly the same. There's no fluctuation at all. So this is in contrast to the NTK limit, where uh, initialization, you have the GP, so there's some uh, constant amount of fluctuation. But a uh, condition on the initialization, the NTK dynamics is uh, deterministic. I see. Okay. Here's, the, here's deterministic for everything, uh, like the initialization everything. as well as the whole dynamics. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, oh, so, so basically, it's, it doesn't have any uncertainty at exactly. all. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's okay. Interesting. Um, so I guess in, in some sense, the, the function after some training time could be described as being a, a function of uh, basically the data somehow, like, uh, and the, the number of iterations, like. Sure, of course. Right, right. okay. So you don't, in that sense, you don't necessarily need to know what the internal activations are if you could write that sort of master function, I guess. Um, uh, I think like the evolution at time t still is going to depend on like exactly what the neural network is doing internally. Uh, I mean, like, for example, you know, if you it, it, like, I think, for example, it's going to be different if you, you know, take, if you go through data in two different orders, the internal network is going to be different. Uh, and you cannot just marginalize the over the data and get something in time to you. Right, okay. I mean, okay, but if you fix the order, yeah, okay, fair enough. But I guess the easiest description will just be to keep track of the activations. That's basically what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I have a quick question, but I can also sure. wait. Until... Go ahead. Um, thanks, Greg. So uh, one thing I wanted to, clar or to clarify was, is the claim that in, in any infinite width limit, the, the the distance that the parameters move is basically goes to zero or I was wondering is there a different in the two regimes you point out in the dichotomy is there a difference in how far the parameters move parameters as in like individual weight coordinates yeah uh yeah there is a difference uh so it also depends on whether you're in the middle of network or the beginning like the input layer or the output layer but uh, typically speaking, in the um, middle of the network, the feature learning limits, the weights, the delta, delta Ws will have every coordinate will be on the order of uh, one over, oh, actually, so this, okay, this actually depends a little bit. Uh, okay, let's, let's phrase it this way. So if you look at the ratio of the order of delta W to the order of the initialization of W, then uh, this ratio, delta W to initialization of W, is uh, one over square root of n in the feature learning limit, but it is uh, one over n for the kernel limits. I see. But so both go to zero then as n. Yeah. Like you, 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 this cannot be one because then your pre activation will blow up. Right. Um, can, I, can I ask a follow up question you. to that? So, so yeah. after a, a, a weight update, are the weights IID? Uh, okay, good question. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, like in the middle network, right? So N by N matrix. Uh, the obvious answer is no, because the one update is an outer product of vectors, right? Uh, 
And uh, so what is true is that the, the vectors, two vectors involved in this outer product will have roughly ID coordinates. But of course, what is not true is that the outer product itself has ID coordinates, right? Because if you look at you know, something, the, the, uh, two items in the same row, then they're, they're gonna be obviously correlated because they share like one coordinate in this, uh, in this vector. Right, so, so the central limit theorem wouldn't hold for these weights? Exactly, that's not the right thing to apply here. What you wanna do instead okay. is uh, low large numbers. So, so if the outer product, if the outer product uh, you multiply by a new vector, what you wanna do is you wanna contract these two to get a scalar, and then you have a scalar multiplied by this vector. And this contraction is a low large number behavior. Okay, thanks. Um, quick question. So just so I know that I'm understanding this maximal feature learning limit correctly. Yeah. Is it true that given an architecture and a training data set, the features that are learned will be deterministic? So this is sort of this, this uh, infinite width limit is just a property of the architecture if we had infinite neurons. Uh, so when you say deterministic, what are you, like, what, what is a deterministic over? Um, just like the features that will be learned. So the function that you end up with, right? So I guess, is this, is this STD or gradient descent? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, so, okay. So, uh, by it doesn't matter. I mean, like you fix, fix some kind of training algorithm. It can be GD or it can be SGT. That doesn't matter, but you fix something. Okay, so given that I, or irrespective of what my initialization is, or like if whatever like the random initialization is and whatever the random data order that I present my network, I will end up with the same features in this infinite weight limit. Okay, so uh, so the thing I don't understand by your question is what do you mean by uh, features? So uh, precisely the reason I'm confused is because Right, like when you talk about features, you're talking about an embedding of an input into like a infinite dimensional space, right? Like you have infinite amount of number of neurons. And uh, so in general, these neurons are not identical. Like it's, it's not like, you know, you embed an input into this like infinite vector and every coordinate in the vector has the same value. So that's not true. So usually there's some variations. Oh, but that's not what I mean. Maybe the better way to say it is the function is the same. Like the neural network function. Yes. Okay, so from the input to logist function. Yes. Okay. Uh, so yes, if you if you fix the data set, if you like fix exactly the training procedure. So like the mini batch sequence, like what is in the mini batches, the learning rate schedule, the algorithm for the the GD algorithm or SGD algorithm. If you fix everything, uh, then what you train at the end is deterministic. Like. In, no matter how you sample, resample, it's going to be the same. Oh, but so if I if I were to use, for example, two different mini batch schedules, would the infinite width limit be different? Uh, yeah, it can be different. In okay. general, I would expect them to be different, you know, in some slight way, but they're going to be different. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's just like, you know, in a finite neural network, if you train using two different schedules, you're gonna get slightly different neural networks. I mean, they're not gonna be too different, but they're gonna be a little bit different. Can I ask one uh, last question there, yeah, sure. Greg, before you move on? Yeah. So in all of this, you talk about the infinite limit. Do you have any control of what the corrections are when you go finite? In other words, it, what's yeah. the next term in the series that you're expanding on? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's also a good question. Um, so, uh, so in certain cases, yes, uh, not so much in other cases. Um, so essentially the answer is this, uh, if the lower order term is essentially like something that doesn't have fluctuation, that's something that's kind of like a low large number beha behavior, then you can calculate this quite easily essentially by just um, uh, skip, you can just like express a lower order term in a different tensor program and then just kind of crank the engine and it works. What's more difficult is that if your lower order term is like some fluctuation, uh, mm -hmm. then, you know, like the intu intuitively, you know, 
any lower order term, like any, like the, the, the largest lower order term, I guess, uh, uh, that fluctuates should be something like a Gaussian. But I think proving this uh, rigorously is kind of uh, tricky. I mean, I haven't thought too much about it, but I thought about it enough to think that it's tricky. Um, <laughs> okay. But, but in general, what I expect is that, you know, if you're like zero, uh, the, the, low, the, the first correction to the, the limit will be like square root of n smaller in magnitude. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Is it like standard asymptotic statistics and then maybe there's some yeah, logarithmic yeah, yeah. correction. Exactly. So I don't expect <clears throat> that to differ from, you know, classical statistics. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Then uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, yeah. People, you know, feel free to leave um, if uh, you get bored. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about the tensor programs technique for deriving the limit. So in particular, a takeaway of this section is you'll learn um, how I actually compute uh, the limit for word of egg and meta learning. Um, so the plan here is that let me just quickly give you the key idea of this approach. Then I'm going to go through in more detail a motivating example of the linear one hidden layer neural network. And uh, then I'll actually tell you what a tensor program is and the associated mathematical machinery, which is summarized by the master theorem. And then finally, I'll package everything together and tell you that this can be used essentially to derive infinite width limit for like pretty practically anything in deep learning. So Greg? Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, can I just take one step back? So sure. the, the correction, the scaling of the correction that you mentioned yeah, as going as one over square root of n is that um, work? I mean, is that because of the scaling of the next cumulant, or what, what's the? Okay, uh, yeah, I, I it's not it's nothing super sophisticated. It's just uh, it, like you know, for example, the typically you expect you know a correction to a low large numbers is some central limit item, which is of order square root of n smaller than you know, the, the limit of the large numbers. Uh, and I haven't seen anything in my calculations so far to contradict this uh, you know, assumption. So I'm just gonna stick with this intuition for now. But I mean, I don't have a like, super rigorous reason to believe that. And, and also um, one of the first graphs you showed shows that basically the uh, performance can only improve when you take uh, when you take width to be larger. So is yeah. that a general property? Yeah, so uh, that's also a very good question. Uh, so in general, this is not true unconditionally, right? Because uh, on, on there are definitely data sets where you can overfit, right? So as your network gets larger and larger, the capacity for overfitting increases. Um, so on the validation set, uh, this is definitely not true. Uh, on the training site, this is definitely true. Like uh, if you uh, use the maximal update uh, parameterization, uh, then it's, I think it's always, it's always gonna be true that the training loss is gonna be better uh, yeah, as you increase yeah. width. Uh, okay. For the validation, I think if you use a like, good amount of regularization, then what I said is still gonna be true for validation. Like, like I said, the, the loss, the validation loss where the validation accuracy will improve with width if you have sufficient regularization. Uh -huh. um, okay, so, so I would, and okay, I'm not sure how would you, is it like a standard regularization like L2 or something? Yeah, like weight decay, for example. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I ask another quick question about sure. like feeling the last and, and first layer? Um, so why wouldn't it be better to like, why is it not dependent on the um, depth of the network at all? Why is it not, for example, you're rescaling the last layer as one over N, maybe you're rescaling the second layer as like one over N to some power that depends on the uh, number of layers and so on. Like why, why is it not gradual and you only rescale the first and the last layer and there's nothing in between there? Mm, okay, yeah, uh, nice. So, um... Uh, so that's a very good question. And in fact, in some 
other regimes, um, what you say is actually relevant, uh, but here because of uh, it's SED, this is actually, uh, is not too big a problem. And um, uh, okay, so the par part of the reason is probably the following. Uh, the way, uh, okay, the way I define stability here is that um, a part, of the, part of the way I define stability and non-triviality here is that uh, I require uh, when you randomly initialize, uh, the pre-activations are always on the order of one. So I don't allow it to blow up and I don't allow it to vanish to zero. And I think, you know, this is a, like a reasonable uh, restriction. I mean, it's really not so much a restriction uh, because if your initialization is going to zero, then for a large enough neural network, your, uh, your the mapping, the embedding of the input to this pre-activation layer will kind of be too small. And at least practically speaking, it's gonna cause numerical issues. And uh, vice versa, it's, it's the same thing if you if it blows up with width. So it doesn't uh, make very much sense to talk about uh, scaling the initialization uh, where it, the, there's some like independent exponent in the ends, uh, sorry, L dependent exponents in the ends. Um, so you, so you can convince yourself that if uh, you know, every layer has to have uh, order one pre-activations, uh, then your like initialization has to be something that essentially doesn't depend on uh, the depth. Uh, if you remove the restriction and say you uh, use ReLU or something like that, uh, then, uh, and also if you like use something like uh, gradient clipping or something like that, then uh, skinning with L actually can matter in those cases, uh, but not in this case. Okay. And so a related and simple question, I mean, what did you even in practice for, you know, smaller width networks, would training improve if we did this rescaling on the first and the last layer? Wait, sorry, say it again. Um, I'm just asking, you know, in, in practical pra practice on like standard width and depth networks, uh, would it make sense to rescale the first and last layer to, let's say, you know, get better training dynamics? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. And uh, so the answer is yes, but uh, to like, to really, um, like measure the effect of it is kind of subtle. So we we have a paper coming up on doing this, and uh, so the answer is yes. But like the way you actually do it is is a bit subtle. Um, so just I will recommend you waiting for our next paper. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. Anything else? How long do we have to wait for the paper? Uh, I don't know. Like, you know, <laughs> like how much, how painful it is to write the paper, I guess. Okay, so um, up, like early next year. Yeah, early next year, yeah. Right. Okay, so let me move on finally. Um, okay, so what is the key idea uh, for tensor programs? So in two sentences is, is the following. So uh, when width is large, uh, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates at any time during training. Using tensor programs, uh, we can recursively calculate such coordinate distributions and consequently understand how the neural network function evolves. So uh, let me remark one thing. Uh, those of you in the audience uh, might be familiar with this kind of intuition if you just talk about uh, initialization, right? Like not deep into the training process, but just initialization. I think this will feel familiar to you because you've probably done some calculation with uh, the NNGP or the NTK. Uh, so in this uh, schematics, uh, what I'm depicting is that, you know, the NNGP calculation is kind of like taking the limit of the first forward pass. Uh, the NTK calculation is kind of like taking the limit of the first backward pass. And in, in this work, we essentially just like do this on steroids, we unroll the entirety of uh, SED. And then we take the limit of the entire thing rather than like taking the limit uh, you know, of the first backward pass in the NTK case and then like reason through some um, bounds to show that things don't move and such and such. 
Um, so again, the takeaway here is that we, we put the whole thing in the box and then we take the limit of the box. Okay, so now let's look at some concrete examples to uh, make this idea come to life. Uh, so this is a very, very simple uh, example. Uh, you know, the, the real thing for like multiple, multiple layers and with nonlinearities is gonna be more complicated, but this captures some of the key ideas. So we're gonna work with this. Um, so first let's assume that the input and output dimensions are both one for simplicity. Then the forward pass can be depicted by this kind of matrix multiplication, right? So the first layer matrix is a, you can think of as a column vector. The second uh, layer is the row vector. Um, and the four passage is given by the matrix multiplication. Uh, and initialization, both of these weight vectors uh, have ID coordinates. So uh, as a result of uh, low large numbers and because of the way we scale uh, these things for the maximal update parameterization, uh, f of i is gonna be a sum of large number of independent things and it's gonna converge to something by low large numbers. In this case, it's zero because things are actually uh, zero mean. Uh, but later, that's not gonna be the case. But here, uh, f of i, the output, the logits will converge to some deterministic number, in this case, zero by low large numbers. And because f of i does uh, the loss derivative of uh, f and with the label also converges. So in the in the backward pass, uh, we can calculate that the gradient for each weight matrix, which weight vector in every layer is essentially the other weight matrix uh, multiplied by the input and this loss derivative. Okay, and you know because, like I said, the loss derivative for large n is going to be very close to some deterministic thing. The fluctuation gets smaller and smaller as width increases. Uh, consequently, the gradients uh, here are going to be approximately ID, right? Like the, the fluctuation in every corner is going to be kind of independent from each other. Um, and as a result, uh, when you uh, do the update, the updated uh, weights are going to still have approximately ID coordinates, right? Because the initialization has this property and the gradients also have this property. So we can, uh, okay, and the other thing is uh, uh, we observe that the, the updated weights are linear combinations of the weights and initialization, right? Because the gradients are of such form and of course the initial weights are of that form. Um, so we can continue using the law of large number intuition and we get F of i is you know, some average uh, and converges deterministically. And again, uh, the loss derivative does as well. And we repeat the gradient uh, reasoning. And uh, so this, so this uh, inductively allows you to reason about uh, the, the function evolution for all times. Okay, so uh, uh, something we observed earlier also holds. So weights at any time are gonna be linear combinations of weights from initialization. And we're gonna use this insight to build a scalable algorithm for computing the infinite width limit of the linear 100 layer new network. So to do this, let's kind of uh, get our hands a little bit dirty. So I'm gonna use some notation now. Uh, I'm gonna use U for the first layer and V for the second layer. Um, and recall that uh, for the maximum update parameterization, the initialization for these uh, weights are uh, are normal with mean zero and variance one over n, okay? Um, and another piece of notation is that after t updates, uh, I'm gonna denote the weights as ut and vt. So subscript t means uh, after t updates. Okay, so earlier I mentioned that, you know, weights at any time are gonna be linear combinations of weights from initialization. So what exactly I mean is that at any time t, you can express it as uh, you know, at times the v, which is the initial v, plus bt times u, which is the initial u. So at and bt are some coefficients in R. And ct and dt uh, likewise uh, define ut in terms of v and u. Um, so these coefficients, a, b, c, d, have the property 
that uh, they converge deterministically to some scalar in the infinite width limit. Um, and uh, of course, when t equals zero, which is the initial condition, uh, at and dt are both one and b and c are zero, kind of for obvious reasons, okay? Um, and uh, when we go through the law large number reasoning again to obtain f of i, uh, we can see that, you know, given that v and vt and ut are in this form, uh, the output f of i is given by roughly at times ct plus bt times dt times the input i. And the reason is that uh, because u and v are sample independently and with zero mean, the, the correlation of this btu term and ctv term, they cancel out. And likewise with the other cross term. Um, and because uh, v times itself, it, it's gonna converge to one. So uh, so you have the, the, the product at, at times ct and likewise the product bt times dt. Okay, so uh, in the backward pass, uh, you know, using the fact that you know the the f converges to something, and so the loss derivative converges to something. Or we have that um, the gradients themselves are essentially going to be uh, linear combinations uh, of the initial v and initial u, uh, initial v and initial u. Um, so here, uh, you know, this gradient has this form, which is a linear. Uh, multiple of the first layer weights and likewise for the gradient of the first layer weights. So uh, when we do the update, uh, you can see very clearly that, you know, this uh, emits some like linear update of the coefficients A, B, C, D uh, for the next time step, which is summarized uh, by these equations. So uh, I think this should make it uh, rather you know, clear of what the pattern is. So let me um, summarize uh, what the equations will look like if you just do all the grunt work. Um, so the maximum update limit of this linear one hidden layer neural network with input and output dimension one, and for simplicity, simplicity assume learning rate is one. Uh, so this limit is given by uh, these equations. So FT is equal to essentially AC times BD times the input and then the way you update A and B is you add some linear copy of C and D and vice versa for C and D and A and B. And then the initial condition uh, is uh, A and D equal to one and then B and C equal to zero. Right? Again, for obvious reasons. Um, so let me very briefly compare against the mean field limit uh, in case uh, there are those of you that wonder uh, but uh, the mean field limit, so the in the literature, mean field limit has two differences uh, compared to the way I'm deriving it. One, they always derive things in terms of PDF of random variables instead of the random variables themselves. And two, uh, their limit is always expressed in continuous time dynamics where here is discrete time. And because the way they frame their limit, it, they actually make things very convoluted uh, and uh, more precisely, like these update equations will be transformed into convolution equations. And this really obscures, you know, the simplicity of these equations. So at least like in terms of like thinking about these in terms of computing the limit, it seems like this tensor program uh, approach is more natural. So, so uh, because B and C are initialized to be zero, then the initial function output is zero, right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. But uh, aren't, aren't neural networks normally initialized to have order one function output? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's why. So that's that's why I say that the standard parameterization is not a feature learning parameterization, right? I mentioned this earlier in the talk. Uh, the standard parameterization is uh, is actually in the kernel regime. So, in the sense that, uh, like the maximal stable learning rate is one over width, and if you use that learning rate, then the features don't move. Uh, you can try to use a large larger learning rate, but then you will blow up. Uh, the dynamics will blow up with width. Okay, so now let's make an interesting observation. So if you look at uh, the, the equation for FT, uh, what it looks like the equation for a uh, width two, you know, one hidden layer linear neural network, right? So 
in this analogy, the second layer weights will be given by A and B, and the first layer weights will be given by C and D. Um, and uh, instead of a random initialization for this, you know, with two neural network, uh, we have kind of a quote unquote diagonal initialization where uh, if you, you know, put the ABCDs in a square matrix, then we initialize them uh, as the identity matrix. Okay, so uh, let me summarize this by this equality. Uh, so in other words, maximum update limit of a linear one layer neural network with random initialization, which is prescribed by the maximal update parameterization is equivalent to a width D in plus D out, which in this case is just two, right? Because one plus one. Uh, with D in plus D out linear one hidden layer neural network with diagonal initialization. Okay. So, so this is what we, uh, we observed in a specific case, uh, but it turns out this is the general pattern. So if you have a arbitrary large D in and D out, uh, this remains true. So like literally if you train an infinite width in maximum update limit of a linear one hidden layer neural network, the result is equivalent to if you train a width D in plus D out linear one hidden layer neural network with this diagonal initialization. Okay. And this is uh, in fact what we use to train the Wartevec uh, experiment because well, lucky for us, Wartevec canonically is exactly a linear 100 layer neural network, uh, like in the original paper. I mean, I actually don't think there's any nonlinear Ortovec uh, in existence. They're always uh, linear 100 layer neural networks. And in the case of Ortovec, D and DR are both vocabulary sizes. So like the inputs and outputs are always like one hot vectors uh, representing like one word in the vocab. So concretely um, on the text A data set, uh, D and plus D R are about 140K on the fill nine, which is a larger data set, D in plus D out is 280K. Okay, so uh, we use a lot of CPU compute to make this work, but it worked. Um, okay, so so that's essentially what I, the main thing I wanna say about um, the motivating example of uh, the one hidden layer linear case and uh, the um, computation of the limit. Uh, here, let me summarize kind of the intuitions we used to derive the limit uh, as far as the, uh, the, the infinite, the form of the infinite width limit. So what we went through is one, the intuition that the weight matrices have ID coordinates and initialization. And second, the function output will converge due to lower large numbers. Uh, then the gradients will have approximately ID coordinates because the things, the scalars all converge and then the, the, the gradients are all scalar multiples of the other weight. So after, uh, Grading update, the weight coordinates are still going to be approximately ID. And then you can repeat this intuition over and over again. Uh, and in a linear case, we know that the weights at any time are linear combinations of weights from initialization. And this allows us to have an efficient calculation of the limit in terms of like another one hand layer linear neural network. Um, any questions so far? Okay, uh, let me just briefly tell you about what uh, needs to be done for the deeper cases. So there, uh, there is a lot more complexity than the one-hand layer case. Um, and the major reason is that uh, when you have a deeper neural network, you have this uh, N by N Gaussian random matrix in the middle of the network from initialization. And uh, they cost, uh, well, they, they create two different kinds of effects um, to the dynamics. Uh, one is it has a central limit effect, which you know may be familiar to you if you have done these NNGP or NTK calculations before. And uh, in short, you know if you have a Gaussian random matrix, you multiply it by some vector which is independent of W, then the output vector is going to be roughly ID and Gaussian. Okay, so it's kind of a roughly central limit behavior. And the other thing, uh, let me just dip my toe into, but not talk about in depth is that W and W transpose are correlated. And uh, this correlation um, will cause uh, changes uh, to the, uh, uh, yeah, this, this will cause some like mathematical subtleties. Uh, 
And if you had done NTK calculations before, like this correlation never really factored into any calculation. Like you can, you could always assume a W transpose is independent of W in the NTK calculation. And that's very specific to uh, like the scenario where you haven't done any update uh, from HD. But in general, when you do feature learning uh, limit and then you do multiple uh, steps of updates, this is gonna start to matter. Okay, so again, I won't go into details because uh, it's very involved in the mathematics, uh, but you can see the paper for details of how to derive uh, these limits. Um, finally, uh, you know, all these, this complexity of, uh, you know, low large numbers, applying these, applying different intuitions, package them in different ways. So they're all kind of summarized by the sensor program framework in a very rigorous way. And uh, in principle, we can write uh, a program that takes in, uh, like a like computer program that takes in a tensor program and outputs the infinite width limit. And uh, I actually have written that program, so it works. Okay, so that finishes uh, my motivating example for the linear one layer neural network. Uh, next, I'm gonna just kind of more formally tell you what is a tensor program. Simply put, uh, it is a set of inductively generated vectors and scalars, starting from an initial set of matrices, vectors, and scalars. So uh, pictorially here, we have you know, a collection of matrices, which are n by n, and n is going to infinity, a collection of vectors, which are dimension n, uh, and then a collection of scalars. And uh, we can generate uh, these uh, uh, vectors uh, using uh, vectors and scalars using three different kinds of rules. So the first rule is that you know you can do matrix multiplication. So you take a square matrix or n by n matrix and you can multiply by a size n vector to get a new vector. The other thing is you can apply a nonlinearity cornerwise to a collection of vectors. So you take a collection of vectors, you line them up uh, so that you know all the corner slices are aligned, and then you can apply a nonlinearity. Uh, to each corner slice. And this nonlinearity can depend on some scalars that you have constructed before. And finally, uh, you can use the moment instruction to take uh, the coordinate average of a vector in the program. Okay, so these are the three rules that you can use to inductively generate new vectors and scalars given some initial set. Um, so, now let's kind of go back to the linear case, the example before, and let's cast the computation of HED there uh, in terms of a tensor program. So uh, these, the weights from initialization, you can think of them as the initial vectors. The xi input you can think of as the initial scalar. Then uh, the computation of the output of the network in the first four pass uh, can be thought of as a composition of nonlin and uh, moment. So the nonlin would uh, calculate the cornerwise product of these two weight vectors scaled by square root n, uh, as, as well as the input scalar. And uh, the moment instruction collapses uh, this you know, cornerwise product into an average. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can check them mathematically. This is exactly f as i. Um, in the backward pass, uh, you know, something similar happens. So uh, the, the update uh, to the weights are gonna be, uh, expre be expressed in a non-in instruction, which is, uh, I guess, maybe a misnomer because this operation is kind of like linear, uh, but, but it's non-in because uh, this operation is a cornerwise operation. So, um, for example, like here, the first layer weights update as you know the initial weights minus uh, the gradients, and the gradients are calculated as this uh, kind of cornerwise product. Okay, so uh, so here I've demonstrated you know how uh, the like one step HED uh, can be expressed as a tensor program, and you can see obviously you can just iterate this to get multiple steps of HED. Um, and here we only need to, to use none in a moment, but for uh, deeper networks, because of this n by n Gaussian matrix in the middle of the network, you have to uh, 
uh, use the MATMO instruction to do it. All right, so uh, so far I just told you what a tensor program is and I told you you can express certain things. Uh, I haven't really told you why it's useful yet. And this is gonna come in uh, when I tell you about the master theorem. So in short, the master theorem tells you how a tensor program behaves in the large end limit, right? And, and combined with the expressivity of the tensor program, you can essentially express whatever you want in a tensor program and then take the limit with this master theorem and, and then you have what you want. All right, so what the theorem says uh, in detail is that uh, if the initial scalars in the program converge deterministically uh, and two, the initial matrices and vectors are sampled as IV Gaussians, so you can think of these as just saying, uh, you know, you have the kind of standard kind of Gaussian, uh, Gaussian random neutralization. Then uh, two things hold. So first, uh, all the vectors generated in the program will have ID coordinates in the large end limit. And there are rules to recursively calculate such limit distributions. Uh, concretely, you can think of these vectors in the program as like embeddings, uh, for example, embeddings uh, of a uh, trained neural network. So this says that, you know, after, if you look at the program that expresses the entirety of training, then if you look at, at the end of training, uh, the embeddings will look like kind of a, a ID vector. And you can understand like what that ID vector looks like and how this vector correlates with other vectors, like other embeddings, for example. Okay, and then the second thing is that the, the scalars in the program will converge to deterministic values and there are rules to calculate these limit scalars. And as concrete examples, you can think of these scalars as outputs or logits of the train network. So if you look at the end of the program, like say you express the training procedure and also the inference procedure on a test set in the tensor program, then you take the limit, uh, then the scalars uh, that uh, represent the output of the function on a test example, for example, uh, would converge to some deterministic value and this allows you to um, understand like how, uh, how well the, the network does on a test set. All right, so that's the master theorem in short. Um, what do you mean by the initial scalars converge deterministically? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, for the purpose of uh, you know, writing things in SGD, you actually don't have to worry about this too much. Uh, for example, this is satisfied vacuously in, in this example. Like in uh, this example, uh, Xi is an initial scalar, but Xi is, is fixed. Like it's, a, it's a, a part of your data set. Like it's some fixed data set and it's fixed with, it doesn't depend on N. So, uh, so it vacuously converges to, to something deterministic because it is deterministic to start with. Um, this uh, this condition that scalars uh, converge deterministically is a bit useful for other purposes, which I think, yeah, probably you don't, you don't have to worry about it uh, for now. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yep. Cool. All right. So now um, we can talk about uh, infinite width limit for essentially anything in deep learning. And uh, you know the context I want to frame uh, frame this around is that I I really you know from trying to like write things uh, in tensor programs from my experience there's kind of a church two in thesis for deep learning in the sense that it seems like any useful deep learning computation can be expressed as a tensor program uh, and just like church two in thesis this is not a formal statement right you cannot prove this formally uh, it's just kind of a kind of hypothesis um, and like for me, you know, the evidence supporting this is just that I haven't really found any major example where you cannot do this. So for example, uh, you can write, you know, SOTA architectures like resonant transformers with like, you know, batch norm, layer norm, all, the, all kinds of bad gadgets, attention uh, in the tensor program. You can write SGD with momentum, with decay. You can do atom, different, you know, adapted uh, algorithms, natural gradient descent, you can do different kinds of tasks like pre-training and fine-tuning and meta-learning like we've shown in this talk. You can do deep reinforcement learning, image generation, and so on and so forth. So uh, pretty much like anything that's done in deep learning these days can be expressed 
in a digital program. So uh, as such, I kind of think of one intuition I have for tensor program is that it's kind of like a compiler, a compiles finite with computation to infinite with computation. So, uh, uh, you know, so this can be both interpreted from a theoretical angle and from a practical angle. Uh, as a theoretician, you know, like this just says that if you want to derive the infinite width limit of any neural computation, like HD training, GAN training, you know, deep reinforcement learning, whatever, just express the computation you want to study as a tensor program and then just apply the master theorem mechanically. And then you're kind of done. Like the, maybe the only creativity you need there is to express things as a tensor program. But once that's done, you, everything's kind of mechanical. Uh, from a practical angle, you can actually write a program that does this like, uh, I mean, like in principle, you can really write a compiler that compiles like PyTorch code to some kind of calculation for the infinite width neural network. Uh, I don't have it right now, but I mean, I have something that's like intermediate. Uh, so I think like that's pretty cool, right? Because it really says that like in principle, we do have a compiler that compiles PyTorch or TensorFlow to run, you know, these like infinitely large neural networks. Like in principle, we can train an infinitely large GPT. And I mean, that's that's something that's pretty cool. All right, so that finishes all I'm gonna talk about about the tensor program technique and also this talk. So uh, let me summarize. Uh, in this talk, um, I've gone through several contributions. So we classified, uh, we defined first of all, ABC parameterizations and then we classified such parameterizations and their infinite width limits. Uh, we identified maximum update parameterization for maximizing feature learning. Uh, we proposed the tensor program technique for deriving the equations of these limits and more generally the limit of any neural computation. And why why should you care? Well, this gives you a framework for studying feature learning in over parameterized neural networks. Uh, it gives you concrete formulas to actually train these feature learning infinite with neural networks. Uh, and also this tensor program technique really, in my opinion, solves the problem of taking infinite width limits, which were dealt with in kind of haphazard ways previously. Uh, looking ahead, there are a lot of exciting questions, I think, that are within reach given the framework uh, in this paper. So for example, what kind of representations are learned in these infinitely wide neural networks? Uh, how does it inform us about you know, the corresponding phenomena in finite neural networks? How does this feature learning affect training and generalization? How does this jive with the scaling laws of language models um, that was published by OpenAI? Uh, can we train infinite with GPT? Uh, and a lot more questions, which are now ripe for the picking. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for staying uh, after the a lot of time. Uh, I can take more questions if you have them. Um, yeah, and here's the QR code for the paper. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Greg. That was very, very interesting. That's all. Thank you with our clap emojis. And Thanks. Open up to more questions if there are any. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, yeah, my question is um, Do you think that there's also a way to use um, your parameterization to come up with a way of setting Bayesian neural network priors such that if you did exact Bayesian inference, you would actually do feature learning at infinite width neural network? Um, uh, like you're asking, like, is there a way to make uh, make the feature learning limit consistent with a uh, Bayesian interpretation? Yeah, so I guess like currently uh, in an infinitely wide Bayesian neural network, you get a GP and you don't do any feature learning. Is there yeah. like a way of using your insights to come up yeah. with some Bayesian yeah, network that does do feature learning? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I've been talking to Yaren about it. Uh, and I think there are some ways like uh, there's no fluctuation, you know, in the output of the network, but there is fluctuation in the interior of the network. So you could possibly use that fluctuation to um, do some kind of uncertainty quantification. Uh, so, okay, I don't know like a perfect answer to your question, but that's like one possible direction. Cool, thanks. So, so um... Uh, maybe just a little step back. I'm not quite sure I understood how these tensor programs are presented or how they are stored if they're the infinite. 
what what is actually stored in this thing? Uh, sorry, you kind of uh, cut out a little bit. Can you repeat your question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so the the question is just what 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 is stored in these tensor programs? Uh, yeah. Okay. So first of all, the tensor program uh, framework right now is a theoretical framework. Uh, you, okay. I mean, you don't really you, you okay you don't really write code for it. But you know, I I personally have a program that allows you to do that. But uh, right now, it is just a theoretical framework. Um, now you may be asking, like, what what is the actual data contained in a tensor program when you take the infinite? Yes, width? Yeah, but that's the question exactly. Right? Okay, so yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so as you see in the um, uh, the one headed layer case, uh, in the linear case, things are kind of very simple. You essentially just have to store the coefficients uh, of each uh, vector at any time in terms of the initial vectors, initial weight vectors, right? So that's very simple. Uh, when you have nonlinearities, uh, uh, things are a bit more complicated in the one headed layer case, but not so much. So essentially in the uh, one headed layer case with nonlinearities, uh, all the wave vectors are gonna be some nonlinear image of the initial wave vectors. So you just have to, you have to store, you have to keep track of um, uh, what is the, the function that defines this nonlinear image. Uh, and then also you have to uh, keep track of like the limits of the scalars. Like for example, the output F, like what is the limit of F as n goes to infinity? Uh, now for deeper neural networks, this is gonna get more complicated because of the presence of these uh, n by n Gaussian matrices. So, uh, you know, if you have done NGP calculations before, then you know that you know, like when you have these kind of Gaussian random matrices, you have to keep track of like the correlation between the input embedding of one input and the input embedding of another input. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, when you have a tensor program of size n, uh, m, say, then uh, if you very generously use these uh, n by n Gaussian matrices then like in principle, you need to store something on the order of O of M squared uh, number of things for your uh, correlation or covariance matrix, okay? Um, uh, and beyond that, you know, uh, every vector will be like a nonlinear image of some Gaussian vectors. So you have to store uh, what, is, um, what is the function defining this nonlinear image. Um, and likewise, uh, like the one layer case, you need to store the, the limits, limits of the scalars. Um, but uh, in terms of storage, I think that's it. Like the, the most sensitive thing is the, uh, the, um, the, the Gaussian, the Gaussian uh, covariance uh, for the central, the central limit behavior of the N by N Gaussian matrix. And potentially also something expensive is uh, the, the, the nonlinearities, the nonlinear functions defining the uh, a vector in terms of the Gaussian uh, parts, the Gaussian vectors, uh, which like if you nest a lot of the nonlinearities together, this can get very complicated. Um, but yeah, so so I think does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So would that mean that once you have deeper networks and you do multiple like some SGD steps, your computation gets too expensive to compute with tensor programs? Yeah, so uh, in general, the the computation beyond, you know, the one hidden layer linear network I showed is gonna be a lot, a lot more expensive. I mean, you can, there are ways to make it, make the cost go down, but in general, if you just like pick a random tensor program, uh, computing the limit is gonna be expensive. So. You can do it, of course, for small programs, but for larger programs, it's gonna be, you need to do some work to make it workable. Okay, thanks. Um, just a question. Um, so can this tensor programs be um, extended to some other limit where, for example, um, we take the depth and the width to infinity at the same time with some fixed ratio, for example? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And uh, I think the I think the answer is yes. Uh, 
uh, I thought about it briefly. Uh, and uh, yeah, you had to dig into the black box of how the master theorem is proven, but I think you can do it. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think you talked about it a little bit, but you know, like this feature learning seems to be obviously good for decreasing training error. Um, but when it comes to generalization, it's not so clear, right? And in some cases, it, you know, it seems that it could lead to overfitting. Have you thought about it much? Um, and as I said, I think you commented briefly on it, but I kind of missed it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in the context of like something like CIFAR 10 classification, right? Uh, then, uh, yeah, definitely you're gonna venture very far from initialization. So like kind of the, you know, the, what prevents NTK from overfitting is gonna, not gonna work here. Uh, so the short answer is that in this setting, I don't have uh, anything to say currently about generalization. Um, but of course, you know, like in another setting in the pre-training and fine tuning setting, uh, we empirically, we know that uh, that the um, uh, this uh, this defined the, the feature learning approach really works really well, uh, but of course you know saying something rigorous about that uh, I haven't thought too much about. Yeah, but you know, um, so the things I'm thinking about that you know what I commented earlier is that with finite with networks we don't have this um, kind of the scaling for maximal feature learning, right? With the first and last mm -hmm. layer. Yeah. Maybe there is some kind of already regularizing effect because we're not doing maximal learning, which leads to features that are more transferable versus like if you did this maximal uh, mm. feature learning, perhaps it would be less transferable. I don't know, maybe it's not really the right way of thinking about it, or maybe for the data sets we have, actually learning maximally is good. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I haven't thought about this, but I think, um... Yeah, I, I don't know if this is the right way to think about it. Uh, I, I mean, to me, uh, like the standard parameterization is parameterized wrong so that I guess you're gonna be closer to the kernel regime. Uh, I mean, it's not clear to me like uh, if that makes a right trade-off between the training loss and the generalization gap. Yeah, so I, I don't know uh, if there's anything useful I can say about that. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There's also a question in the chat. You want to read it out and answer it? Yeah. Uh, so something like deep ensemble could be used. Um, so yeah, so for the deep ensemble, I think you'd have to be kind of careful. If you like ensemble a bunch of feature learning in your networks, then uh, in the limit of large width, Right, like there, like the number of uh, items in the ensemble is finite. Then, in the limit of large width, the uh, the new networks are all going to be evolving in the same way, exactly the same way. Like they're all going to be initialized uh, as zero identically, and the evolution equation for all of them are going to be exactly the same. Yeah, so, but but you said it depends on the mini batch schedule, right? So I, I was saying deep ensembles okay. because in in their Basically, the randomness, as far as I understand, comes basically because of, uh, uh, okay, well, partially from initialization, that's true, yeah. maybe, but, but but also because of uh, you typically re-randomize the minibus schedule. I mean, I'm not sure actually which of those two matter most. That's, a, I guess, an interesting question, but I, I, you will still have some randomness from that. Sure, yeah, okay. I mean, so yeah, I, I agree. So if you randomize training procedure, somehow like the batch order of the, what's in the batch, uh, or even like a learning rate schedule, uh, then that could be a way to um, make sure that the items in the ensemble converge with different functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that could be viable, but I don't know if that's actually gonna be effective. Uh, I think that's a, something probably worth investigating. Thanks. All right, uh, any other questions? Um. Hey, Greg. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to mention that, uh, so I, I guess I, I've been working on um, the similar question of what's the boundary between, oh, sorry, what's the boundary between um, the, sorry, someone's just calling me. Uh, 
I'm trying to stop. Okay, what's the boundary between the nonlinear regime and the linear regime, which I guess is similar to the boundary between feature learning and not feature learning. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I, the way I've been looking at it is not statistical. So it's um, just using perturbation analysis, like networks build out of operators. Operators have a perturbation structure. For example, for a matrix, we know quite a lot about its perturbation structure. Um, and the finding of this work is that sort of to, to initiate the nonlinear behavior, you need to have a kind of finite relative, um, which is, is sort of at odds with the view of in the infinite width limit that the change in parameters goes to zero, because this is saying actually you sort of need finite relative change. Um, but I guess I'm wondering if there's a way to connect these two different views or. Um, Sorry, like, what, like what, I think you cut out a little bit. Uh, so what what is the criterion for your nonlinear behavior? Right. So the, the, the central idea is that for the nonlinear behavior to happen, you need to have like for the, the, the delta W to the parameters should be proportional to the W. So the the parameters should undergo some kind of finite relative change. Uh, yeah, so this definitely doesn't work in the neural network case. Uh, like I said, because you will just blow up. Like, I mean, I guess, okay, so it depends on whether you allow blow up or not. I mean, maybe you say, okay, I don't care about blow up. Suppose I can implement a numerical scheme that, you know, can tolerate arbitrary amount of blow up. I can like go arbitrarily close to infinity. Then okay, in this case, you could investigate uh, parameterizations that uh, allow blow up. You know, you can remove this uh, instability condition. Um, maybe then, like you will uh, be more consistent with uh, what you're doing. But at the very least, if you apply your criterion to a real neural network that's wide enough, then you're gonna see blow up in the dynamics. So when you say blow up, could you just elaborate a little more? Yeah, like so. Suppose uh, you um like take one step of SGD, uh, and uh, you let like suppose the network is very wide, then the uh, oh, sure. uh, then uh, what happens is that um, the like the preactivation. Uh, will blow up to infinity because like your your delta w is too large, like the so when you when we multiply delta delta w by the pre previous activation vector, the output is gonna scale like square root of n, square root of width, every coordinate. So when width is very large, this vector is gonna gonna go out of floating range, floating point range. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think the well, I, I'm not sure that happens, and the reason I think is because because of the fact that as you take the width to infinity, the the size of the weights goes to zero. Sorry, each in, each individual weight has to be taken towards zero. That means yeah, that. No, so yeah, right, right. So I'm saying if you do your thing, which which is like for example, yeah, scale things like Adam does, where like every update is order one, then as you uh, use a very, if you, as you do one, as she said for a very, sorry, one atom step for a very wide neural network, the preactivation is going to blow up like square root n. Right. Okay. I, yeah, maybe I, I'd love to talk more with you about it, but sure. Um, yeah. Anyway, th thanks for answering. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there further questions? I don't see any. So before we thank Greg again, let me make an announcement. Next week, we have um, two talks in this um, series because it's part of a workshop on machine learning in string theory and fundamental physics I'm organizing. And we will have a talk by Hagai Maron from NVIDIA Research on equivariant neural networks and uh, symmetries, and a talk by Sergei Gukov from Caltech on applying methods for machine learning and reinforcement learning and transforming neural networks to a problem in 
pure mathematics, more specifically not theory. So I hope to see you all there. And let's thank Greg again for all the time he took and for this excellent talk. Yeah, thanks Fabian. Thanks everyone for attending and sticking around for very long. <laughs>